Hi, this is Eric Boyce, CEO and Chief Investment Officer for BKA Wealth Consulting, and welcome to Charts of the Week for June 14th of 2021. Please share a disclaimer for important information. We'll go ahead and start off with our high frequency data. As you can see here, uh, most of the data looks really good uh, on balance. Uh, we do have an anomaly in the open table restaurant industry data. It looked like it was down about 11.6%. Um, not really sure what's going on there because the trends have been fairly consistent and positive as of late. Uh, as you can see here, the monthly figures are still very robust though. So I don't worry too much uh, necessarily about that. And perhaps uh, there was a, a lot of volume during the Memorial Day weekend uh, that skews that number. But uh, looking at TSA checkpoint data uh, for the week, that's very strong. Uh, and continues to be strong on a monthly basis, as do most of these indicators. So uh, we're continuing to see strong growth, both in the industrial and shipping areas. We've got a chart later that kind of indicates how shipping rates and container demand is really spiking here. So rail car traffic up, uh, steel production up, uh, box office receipts rebounding as we get more new feature length films being released, uh, kind of symptomatic of people and their desire of wanting to get out and do more. Uh, so that's very positive. Commercial flights and, as I mentioned, TSA checkpoint data, uh, very, very strong. As it relates to employment, here's a chart from uh, Statistica uh, showing uh, job losses in certain categories that we've been monitoring. And we know that from the pandemic that, that the hospitality and leisure has been adversely impacted. You can still see that we're uh, about 7.6 million jobs short of where we were uh, in February. We've had a net gain, a tremendous net gain, uh, but of that 7.63, uh, about 6.8 have been uh, in the uh, service area, and 2.5 million of those are in leisure and hospitality alone. But you can see government, education, professional services, retail, even manufacturing, which has been very strong. So it's a little interesting to see manufacturing in here, but clearly some of the other service and more discretionary spending areas have been more adversely impacted. So with all the progress that we've made in the labor market, uh, we still have a ways to go. Uh, and uh, you can see here where those areas are. And here's a couple items from our high frequency table, uh, specifically the open table restaurant activity, as well as the airline volume. We can see both of those are continuing to trend in the right area. This is data as of 531. So it's fairly current. You can see the uptrend in both of those areas that are being closely watched by a lot of people for not only the activity levels, mobility levels, but also uh, discretionary spending uh, levels, et cetera. And here's a chart on global economic growth. This is a world GDP. So basically, uh, it's, it's a summary of all of the global growth that's going uh, on outside of the U.S. and inclusive of the U.S. We've been spending a lot of time talking about what's going on here in the United States. But elsewhere, it's, it, it's very important to note that we have a global recovery underway. And you can see that in this chart a very dramatic recovery from our lows last year, and we're on pace for the strongest global growth in over 50 years. I mean, we've been talking about how domestic growth is going to be as strong as it's been in decades. Well, global growth is going to be exceptionally strong. In fact, I would uh, also offer that some of the data that's the devil in the details here is that Europe is leading the growth. Here's a summary of the latest data that we have from the National Federation of Independent Business. This is a small business hiring plans index. And uh, with all of the data and the rhetoric that we already know and have in our possession about uh, choke points and hiring, a lot of, uh, uh, we've had a dramatic rise in open positions, but we've had uh, some challenges in getting those positions filled. And you don't have to go any farther than going to a restaurant uh, and looking at uh, all of the empty tables and asking, well, why can't I sit there? And they say, well, you know, we'd love to open it up, but we don't have enough workers. And that's, that's very uh, consistent across not only the restaurant industry, but a lot of areas. But uh, 
at least the hiring plans from small businesses far and wide are very, very high. So I think once we get past this era uh, and this uh, transition point, if you will, where some of the state subsidies for unemployment insurance, the supplementary benefits go away, you're going to begin to see a little bit more of this. Now, it's not going to recover in total because there's still other things that are at play in keeping people off on the sidelines, namely child care, uh, and there's some other things there too. But uh, it's good to see that hiring plans are, are robust. That means that there's a lot of confidence and enthusiasm on the part of small business owners on wanting to grow their business and feeling like they're at a point where they can. And so that's translating directly into these hiring plans. Here's a quick look at uh, the, um, uh, essentially from, from Bloomberg's perspective, uh, weekly consumer comfort. And you can see there's two elements of this. There's a buying climate, uh, which has recovered dramatically, but it's lagging actually the state of personal finance. So we know that uh, with all the supplementary benefits that people have received, the stimulus payments, et cetera, we know a lot of the higher income cohorts have been saving that. We know savings rates have really gone through the roof, even though they're coming back down a little bit now that we're past the stimulus, stimulus payments. But uh, household balance sheets are really improving uh, to the extent that we the cohort of uh, consumers that also own homes are witnessing dramatic increases in the value of those homes. Uh, and that's for a lot of people, their, their largest asset. So we're seeing household balance sheets really improve. Uh, and as a result, it's dragging that buying climate along with it. So you can see in this chart clearly where that's moving in that upward direction. And we're not quite where we were in terms of buying climate. Um, before the pandemic, but we're getting very close now in terms of the state of personal finances, we're, we're absolutely there right now. And a lot of it does have to do with uh, home values and, and whatnot. So it'll be interesting to watch this as we move ahead uh, in the next several months, but clearly the consumer-based patterns are moving in the right direction. Thought it'd be a good time to check in on CPI. We've had some recent data. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have the full all-in consumer price index month over month. Uh, that number came in slightly above expectations. You can see the trend has been higher. Uh, we had a really high spike in uh, consumer inflation last month. And a lot of it had to do with the recovery in a lot of the areas, and we'll see this in a, in, in a moment. Uh, recovery in areas that have been really uh, adverse, uh, adversely impacted from a price standpoint from the pandemic. Uh, a lot of service areas, uh, you know, car rentals, you know, things like this. And, and that's definitely picked up. And we've seen a continuation of that. And, uh, and it's not just, you know, the year over year impacts, you know, what they call the base effects. Now, this, these particular charts show month over month. So this is, uh, uh, a fairly uh, dramatic increase that we've seen in inflation over the last several months, uh, but it hasn't really translated into long-term inflation expectations yet. I mean, the inflation expectations are moving up, but not as dramatically as you would expect looking at these charts here. Uh, so on the right-hand side, we strip out food and energy, and you get to a core consumer price index or core CPI, and core CPI is actually moving higher too. We're seeing rents, owner equivalent rent, uh, we're seeing other things uh, filter into that. And you're beginning to see higher prices uh, clearly on food uh, and you know, housing and th things like that are moving higher. And even on the, uh, the uh, core side, uh, the estimate was for half of a percent. And we got seven tenths of a percent. So uh, we are watching this very closely. Uh, a lot of discussion is, if, is this going to be transitory and is this going to go back down? And the answer is yes, probably, uh, but it's a conditional answer because the full answer, I think, really um, resides on where you think inflation is going to wind up after uh, the transitory price inflation moves aside. And I do think still, and I've mentioned this in several for several weeks and even months now that I think we're going to wind up at an inflation level uh, that's going to be higher than where we were. And that's okay as long as we don't get negative surprises in that.
I thought this was an interesting chart uh, from Charles Schwab, and it takes the consumer price index that we just looked at, and it, sub and it subtracts the producer price index, which we know is exceptionally high. We've, we've looked at this for weeks now. You know, a lot of the uh, component and input prices are moving higher. Uh, so PPI is exceptionally high right now. And so if you subtract that from CPI, what you get is a huge differential. And so Schwab has gone back and tracked this from 1948. And we're as, at a, a, as low a point as we've seen in many decades right now. And you can see that on the far right here. Uh, and so what they've done is they've married this data up against what happens in the market and the S&P 500 performance. And so, you know, where we are now is in this hugely negative spread. Uh, and not too surprisingly, you see you know, both on the forward six month and the forward one year analyses for, you know, historical periods in which the producer price index year over year change has been greater than the consumer price index change that returns are a little bit more subdued. And I think that's probably apt here, even though I think there's upside uh, momentum available for stocks because earnings are moving up so high. I do think that we've seen a lot of the heavy lifting last year uh, and gains are gonna be a little bit harder to come by and that they're going to be uh, earnings driven uh, henceforth. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, I thought I'd put a couple of these components in here. And the one on the left is uh, the consumer price uh, year over year, the CPI component increase for uh, car and truck rentals, as well as uh, domestic services. And I put them in here for, uh, for effect here, essentially because car and truck rentals have gone through the roof. And that's clearly evident here. And you've seen in some cases where, you know, rental prices are over 100%. And that's phenomenal. Uh, and it has a lot to do with the fact that uh, new cars are in short supply because of the semiconductor shortage, which is going to take time to work itself out. Used car prices are really high. And the combination of that and the fact that rental companies during the pandemic were selling off their fleets to raise cash. Uh, and now fleet inventory for rental is actually down. And so that's putting a cost push on on that whole market and then you can see on the on the right hand side was what i was referring to before and these are the areas that were essentially most impacted by the pandemic uh, you can see new vehicles are, are up and there's a lot of reasons for that but uh, used cars trucks airfares household furnishings uh, as well as apparel are all up This is something that I think we're going to be watching for some time, and, uh, and, and it's very symptomatic of the economy recovering faster than the supply chain can support. And, and you know, with the pandemic, there was a lot of shutdowns of production, of shipping, uh, and a lot of things that were taken offline. And, and we're at a point now where we're, we're really stuck. We're in a choke point. And, and uh, you can clearly see that on the left hand side. These, these are container rates uh, for various ports, uh, Shanghai, Rotterdam, New York, LA. Uh, but you know, really, if you just look at that composite, it tells the full story that the container rates are exceptionally high. I mean, you can go back here to 2011 and there's nothing like that, nothing like what's going on right now. Uh, you can see new orders for container ships uh, have really picked up here in 2021 as we're struggling to kind of revive the inventory, uh, or I should say the capacity uh, for the shipping industry. So both of these things are, are at play here. And I think they're, uh, in, they're going to be sticky in terms of their influence on prices, uh, on lead times for shipping uh, and, and other things that uh, we're gonna have to monitor. And I think it could, help to provide a, maybe a consistent tailwind of uh, inflationary pressure. Now here's some data uh, on some of the stuff that we've been following. Now, the, 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 the one that captures everyone's attention because, uh, you know, of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, the need for uh, additional home inventory is lumber prices. And you see lumber prices uh, were up dramatically last month and they've come off their high. That's not to say that they're above average. And you can say that for corn, iron, 
uh, wheat uh, and copper, you know, so you get a mix of the soft commodities as well as the hard and industrial commodities. Uh, and they're all elevated. Uh, but the good news is that they've come off their highs. And some of this goes back to this notion that we've already talked about, about some of the inflation and cost inputs being transitory. But as you can see here, most of these commodities are above their prior levels, their trend line levels, at least through the, the beginning of this uh, this year. Uh, if you take a longer look, I mean, it, you know, lumber is well above its historical trend line dating back, say, another decade. Um, but, uh, but we'll continue to monitor this. It's very important uh, for, for the production channel uh, to have some controls here. Here's a quick look at uh, average hourly earnings and the employment cost index. So the ECI is something that we want to monitor because if there's going to be a real problem with inflation, it's going to likely come from uh, employment costs and labor costs. Uh, average hourly earnings have been all over the map because of the pandemic. I think they're beginning to normalize close to a rate, uh, at least a, a trend line or what we call them line of best fit here for this particular time series, which goes back to 2001. Um, but, you know, you can see that the ECI is a, is a little less volatile and, and it's, a, it's a good indicator. You can see it trending up and I think it's going to continue to trend up uh, as our average hourly earnings kind of resettle as we continue to reopen the economy. Here's a quick snapshot of the city, uh, Citigroup Economic Surprise Index. And we've showed this to you. And in fact, I think we even had it in a chart pack a couple weeks ago, just saying that the, the, the volume of surprises is going down. Uh, and this is a moving, an eight day moving uh, average. And, um, and, and what I thought was interesting, uh, Charles Schwab did the analysis and you can see the arrow that says we are here. Uh, we have, uh, you know, really reversed course uh, and the surprises are going away as we're beginning to, I guess, normalize in this recovery. And so there's not as much shock value out there in the data, uh, uh, perhaps inflation notwithstanding. However, what this is telling us is that uh, we do, we, we continue to have upward potential in the stock market. And basically, you know, where this index is right now would suggest uh, based on a uh, time series going from 2003 to 2021 that we should have about eight to eight and a half percent uh, rise uh, in the uh, S&P 500 on an annualized basis. Now, I don't know if it's going to turn out that way. Uh, I think we had another chart just a few slides ago that suggested maybe that that's going to be a little bit more muted. But I think what it does is it points to this notion of that there's still upward movement capability uh, in the uh, equity indices. Here's a plot of the forward PE versus operating earnings. And, and this is something that you know has been the story in the equity markets over the last six months. And I think it'll continue to play out. Uh, you can see the overlay. I guess the first thing I'd like to point out is operating earnings. Uh, and, and that's that uh, kind of uh, amber yellowish line uh, and and it's it's moving higher we've recovered considerably on earnings and they continue to move higher and so the dotted line that extends out from the far right shows where the estimates are going and, and the estimates are very robust now uh, we do run the risk of those estimates being a little too optimistic and maybe they come back down to earth a little bit but right now the sentiment is is completely in favor uh, and so when you look at the forward price to earnings ratio, now we have come down because of earnings. Uh, now the price to earnings ratio is expected to fall because of the earnings. And uh, if you paint this picture and if it plays out like this would suggest in terms of the estimates out there, then uh, that clearly would suggest that there's more upside in the uh, equity market because valuations then become cheaper uh, and, uh, on a, on, a, on a trend line basis. And again, to the notion that this is not just a US phenomenon, uh, here's the EPS growth estimates for a lot of the uh, major uh, economic uh, players in the G8 or G7, I should say. 
And, and you see that Eurozone, as I mentioned early on in the, in the webcast here, is kind of leading the pack. So UK, Eurozone, witnessing tremendous uh, 2021 earnings uh, growth estimates. Uh, even as the U.S. began to emerge from its economic doldrums sooner than everybody did, uh, I think what that did was it set the stage of 2021 being a more robust year for those economies that were struggling uh, at a time where the U.S. was beginning to emerge uh, economically. Here's a quick snapshot of the S&P 500, and uh, I think it goes without saying uh, that uh, you know we continue to uh, chart a very distinctive direction in the index. Uh, we've already talked about price to earnings ratios coming down because of strong earnings. Even if earnings are not as robust as, as we uh, or the market expects right now, uh, there's still room for that multiple to come down and leave more upside potential in the equity markets, despite the magnitude of the, the increase that we've seen thus far uh, post-pandemic. Now, looking at the market uh, through some different lenses, uh, the first thing I want to point out is the volatility index, or, or the VIX, if you will. Um, and we have really come down in volatility. Uh, and uh, again, I think a lot of portfolios, including a lot of ours, are positioned for a spike in volatility. It's interesting to see that we've had a fairly consistent uh, downtrend in volatility as of late. And, um, and a lot of this has to do with complacency. A lot of this has to do with this perceived confidence and the ability for the S&P 500 index to increase uh, earnings at the rate uh, that we showed you a couple slides ago. Uh, and there's just a, a lot of enthusiasm and confidence sitting in the market right now. Uh, and it's driving volatility a lot lower. As a result, we're seeing uh, more downward pressure on the 10-year government bond yield. Uh, this is very interesting at a time where we do have this whiff of inflation and there's conversation about the need to raise interest rates because of this inflation pressure, whether or not you believe it's transitory or not. Uh, but it's very odd to see um, the Treasury yields moving lower as they have been. I would have expected them to kind of settle in around uh, 160, uh, but they've now uh, essentially broken through 145, uh, and they're now uh, on this chart looking back essentially a month uh, down, you know, roughly uh, uh, about 30 basis points. And as a result of the 10 year Treasury moving down despite higher inflation, what we get is a, uh, a real yield. Uh, that's uh, considerably negative. I mean, as negative as we've seen it in decades. Uh, and, and this is a very odd situation here at a time where you would normally see, as I mentioned last slide, the uh, 10-year yields move higher in concert with this inflationary pressure or perceived pressure. Uh, in this case, all it's doing is making real yields more negative uh, because the inflation is there, but the yields uh, are not uh, moving in corresponding fashion, uh, which is which is a bit unusual. Uh, I think it, it probably, uh, if anything, tells you something about supply and demand right now. I think the, the Federal Reserve is, uh, it's not impacting the treasury market yet, but uh, they're slowing, if not reversing, some uh, purchases of corporate uh, bonds. Uh, now they don't own very many of those at all, uh, so it's not moving the market much, uh, at least I don't think it is. Uh, but it is symptomatic of the Fed beginning to um, perhaps ease off the, the, the pedal a little bit. And so, you know, right now you've uh, got low yields, which is high demand. Uh, you still have a lot of buying impetus uh, for treasuries, and you certainly have a lot of issuance uh, as we're having to, to finance our, our de deficits. Uh, but um, we'll have to watch this in particular, this real yield uh, coming up, uh, because it, ha it does have rather uh, dramatic implications for equities as well. And we've already seen in the equity market a corresponding drop in real dividend yields and real earnings yields on the part of the S&P 500. Here's a couple of charts that kind of give some insight into where the market uh, thinks that uh, we're going to 
where they think we're going to get our first rate increase. And right now, it's it's really not until the end of 2022, if not you know the beginning of 2023. That's where the market is now. The Fed is still steadfast in their rhetoric that we're not going to get it until perhaps mid. Uh, 2023 or whatnot, uh, I, I think. And and what's interesting on the right hand side is that the probability rates, uh, as measured by futures, are are really not suggesting a, kind of an acceleration of that timeline. I mean, there's a, a there's a very odd sense of complacency with regard to interest rates and inflation right now uh, that you know the Fed has done such a loud and vocal job of telling the market that it does not want to rate, raise rates and it's okay with letting the economy run a little bit hot, uh, that uh, that the probabilities have actually gone down of a rate hike by the end of 2022, uh, even though that number is still 60%. Uh, but, uh, you know, this will be something that, that, you know, that will be interesting to watch just in the sense of where inflation winds up and does that begin to trigger rates moving higher at the longer end of the curve. I thought I'd update something that we covered uh, pro probably two, three months ago. And, and this has been an astounding development. Uh, and both of these numbers come from Evercore. And if you look on the left-hand side, federal receipts on a 12-month moving average uh, have been up tremendously. These are tax receipts, corporate and individual. Uh, these are uh, you know, basically receipts from fees and, and everything else that flows through the government coffers. Uh, at a time where we thought that we were going to be really challenged, uh, certainly this time last year, we had no idea how this pandemic was going to evolve and feeling that we're going to be, you know, below trend growth for years to come. And so that prompted a lot of stimulus uh, discussion in Washington about having to provide support for state and local governments, which is actually noted on the right hand side. And so, you know, this is this is the the data behind the argument that state and local governments really don't need the help anymore, even though it's been discussed uh, in these follow-on packages, because state and local tax receipts have gone up too, uh, in fairly dramatic fashion, uh, in fact, uh, where they were, you know, receipts, uh, you know, from a, on a relative basis, stronger than they've been since probably before the global financial crisis. So uh, in very interesting developments here. Here's a quick look at our yield curve. So we've been spending a lot of time talking about interest rates and, and here is the difference between where we were just on the eve of the pandemic, which is in that uh, kind of that gold amber or gold yellowish uh, uh, bar. And then the blue represents where we are now. So obviously since then we had a pandemic and the Fed lowered interest rates to zero, whereas they were, you know, one and a half, 1.6%. Uh, prior to the pandemic, but the yield curve was really flat. And I think it's really good to kind of take take a step back and, and do uh, some reflecting here. And at that time, uh, the equity market was also strong, uh, but there was a beginning, uh, there was a feeling of, and, and in our portfolios, we were beginning to introduce some portfolio downside protection or what we call like portfolio insurance, if you will. Uh, guarding against uh, maybe a reversal of fortunes in the equity market. Uh, a lot of it had to do with the fact that this yield curve was really flat at that time. As you can see, the short maturities, uh, the long maturities rather, are not significantly higher than the short term maturities are. Now that's totally changed, right? So the yield curve has steepened and it looks more normal, in fact, uh, than, than it certainly did uh, on the eve of the pandemic. This is a quick look at the dollar. So this is the Bloomberg uh, U.S. dollar index. And, you know, we've seen uh, a bit of a turn. Uh, this time series goes back to uh, 2011. And, you know, obviously we've had periods of strong and weak dollar movement. Right now the dollar is weakening. Um, you know, there's not a lot of impetus uh, behind the Fed, as we literally just discussed, on raising interest rates anytime soon. Uh, whereas we've seen other central banks um, begin to raise rates uh, to kind of maybe address what they feel is inflation uh, in their uh, local regimes, but we haven't seen that here. And so dollar uh, is under a little bit of pressure, which 
again, has implications for equity markets. It has implications for other things, uh, perhaps gold. But uh, and, but from an equity standpoint, you've got uh, domestically domiciled firms that do business overseas. Well, in a weak dollar environment, um, you know their exports are much more attractive to um, to overseas buyers, and because the dollar is weaker, and so that would tend to bode well for exporting firms in the S&P 500 index where their uh, volumes are greater because their goods are more attractive. Uh, but we'll, again, it'll bear itself out in the earnings data over the next several quarters of where this dollar uh, eventually winds up. But I do think there's probably some more downside pressure to the dollar before the dollar begins to recover. And uh, I think we probably will uh, end on this note, which um, I found uh, in a JP Morgan Asset Management Research piece. Uh, it's always healthy, I think, to look at this uh, on occasion. And this is the, I guess, the most recent data. But, you know, with all of the conversation about, you know, should we send our kids to college, you know, given the cost inflation um, during the pandemic, obviously there was a lot of uh, dropouts or not dropouts, but just um, uh, lower census levels, I should say, and certainly amongst international students. Uh, but there's still value in having a bachelor's or advanced degree relative to just uh, graduating from high school. Again, there's there's a, a lot of kind of interwoven socioeconomic arguments, uh, uh, both pro and con, and I'm not here to opine on all that, just to say that the, the, the data uh, that we're presented with here is, is it bears clear evidence of the benefits financially of having a bachelor's degree or some form of advanced uh, degree. But uh, clearly, you know, there's also some very relevant arguments to be made that we need to bolster the trades, uh, that there is that there is room for people in our society for skilled and semi-skilled, but not necessarily degreed uh, workers. Um, and uh, so uh, this is just kind of a a back check without necessarily offering any particular uh, conclusions or suggestions. Well, that will do it for this week. Uh, on behalf of the entire team at BK Wealth, I appreciate you spending the time with us to look at our charts of the week. Uh, welcome any feedback that you have. Hope you have a safe week, a wonderful and productive week, and we'll see you again soon. Take care.